Okay, welcome back guys. This is going to be a continuation of our practice questions for the orthopedics system. <clears throat> so we'll pick up where we left off just after finishing um, SLE. So we'll say um, a female with recurrent miscarriages and an increased PTT, so that intrinsic pathway, with a VTE, venous thromboembolism. What does she have? So what do you think she would have? Recurrent miscarriages, increased PTT with a VTE. And also, what gives a false positive for RPR in syphilis? So that's going to be antiphospholipid syndrome, APS. And also, the false positive for RPR is going to be anticardiolipin antibodies, which would also be found in that condition. Okay, so next one is a 45-year-old female. She has dyspareunia. She has keratoconjunctivitis sicca. She has dental caries, lateral face bulging and statorrhea, what does she have? So she has these culmination of symptoms. What are the antibodies that are found in this condition? What is the screening test we wanna do in this condition? <clears throat> what is the treatment for this condition? And what are some of the complications? So dyspareunia, keratoconjunctivitis sicca, which is dry eyes, dental caries, why do you have dental caries? Decreased saliva production, lateral face bulging, so she may have parotid gland enlargement on one side or both. And steatorrhea, so a lack of fat-producing enzymes such as lipase to break down the fat leads to steatorrhea. So what does she have? So this is going to be Sjogren's syndrome. Sjogren, Sjogren's syndrome is an exocrinopathy. So all these exocrine glands, dyspareunia, she's having vaginal dryness, keratoconjunctivitis sicca, so decreased lacrimal gland production, dental caries, like we said, decreased saliva production, same thing with lateral face bulging and steatorrhea, decreased lipase from the pancreas. The antibodies for this condition are going to be anti-SS Rho and La. So Rho and La for Sjogren syndrome. And the screening test we want to do is the Schreimer test. So the Schreimer test is when we put that piece of paper in the eye. And typically we would see a certain uh, millimeters get soaked with that paper, but there's they're producing less tears in... Um, in Sjogren's syndrome, so it'd be less. So a positive Schreimer test will be less soaking of the paper because we're having that exocrinopathy of the lacrimal glands there. And a treatment can be pilocarpine, which is a cholinergic. So remember cholinergic, salivation, lacrimation, urination, defecation, GI and emesis. So our sludge side effects for pilocarpine, a cholinergic. And that's what we want in these people because we want to increase those secretions. And also a complication is non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, NHL. What is the most common bug, bacteria, in dental caries? So most common bug in dental caries, that's going to be strep mutans. So strep mutans in dental caries. What does CREST stand for? C-R-E-S-T. What are the antibodies associated with this condition? How about if it is systemic, then what antibodies do we have? So we need to know the difference between CREST and systemic and what antibodies are associated with each of these because it might just give you the antibodies in the condition and you can't really differentiate between crest and the systemic form just based on the couple symptoms that they give you. So, so for crest, that's gonna be calcinosis, Raynaud's phenomenon, esophageal dysmotility, sclerodactyly, and telangiectasias. And for that, it's gonna be anti-centromeres for crest. So anti-centromeres, antibodies for crest, and then for systemic sclerosis, it's going to be the SCL70. So SCL for systemic, centromere for crest. Okay, next patient comes with oral painful ulcers, genital ulcers, and also ocular problems, conjunctivitis, in an Asian 30-year-old. So Asian 30-year-old, O, G, and O. So that's how I remember it, O, G, O for Bichette's. So that's going to be Bichette's syndrome. Ocular, genital, and um, oral. Next patient is a four-year-old that has oral ulcers, conjunctivitis, and a rash that desquamates. They also have lymphadenopathy and extremity changes. And he's also had a high fever for over four days, importantly. What does he have and what's the major complication of this condition? And also, what is the treatment? <clears throat> So this one is Kawasaki's disease. So Kawasaki's, Kawasaki's disease, we need to have those culmination of symptoms. How I remember it is C-R-M-E-L. 
and uh, coronary artery an aneurysms are the biggest complication that we need to be worried about. The treatment for Kawasaki's is going to be ASA, aspirin, which is the only time we really give aspirin in kids because we don't want to risk Rye syndrome, and IVIG if it's serious. So we want to prevent those coronary artery aneurysms from forming in Kawasaki's disease. So next patient, patient with a hypertent, patient with hypertension and hepatitis B and C, they also have livido reticularis and a P anca positivity. What do they have? So P anca positivity, hepatitis B and C, also livido reticularis. That's going to be P A N, polyarteritis nodosa. And remember that hepatitis B and C association with pan. Okay, patient has asthma, eosinophilia, and a chronic rhinosinusitis with a positive P anca as well. What does he have? So positive P anca again, like we said, PAN has positive P anca as well as this condition. So P anca positivity, asthma, eosinophilia, and chronic rhinosinusitis as well. That's going to be Churg Strauss or eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangiitis. So Churg Strauss, eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangiitis. The next patient has glomerulonephritis, crescents forming, you saw on biopsy. They have a saddle nose deformity. They have a URI that's refractory. And they have a C anca positivity. What do they have? So saddle nose deformity, that's pretty pathognomonic. Refractive sinusitis and URIs, and also a C anca, as well as kidney involvement. So that's going to be Wegner's or granulomatosis with polyangiitis. So how, how remember that C anca is C kind of looks like the G, just G is a little bit extra. So C is close to G, so Wegner's is the one with that C anca, whereas MPA, um, or rather PAN and Church Strauss are the ones with the P anca. Okay, so next one is palpable purpura and a P anca is what? Palpable purpura and a P anca is what? Microscopic polyangiitis. So MPA for palpable purpura and a P anca positivity. Next one is hemoptysis and hematuria. What does that make you think of? If a patient has a combination of hemoptysis and hematuria, you want to be thinking of, what do we see on biopsy of these patients? A pathognomonic finding on biopsy of these patients will be what? And what type of antibodies will these patients have? So what do we see on biopsy? What type of antibodies will they have? So this is, of course, going to be good pasture syndrome. Good pasture syndrome. We're going to see crescent shapes, rapidly progressive crescent shapes on biopsy. And also we're going to see IgG linear deposits and an anti-glomerular basement membrane antibody. So that's what's going to be for good pasture syndrome. This is an important one. What are the four neg what are the four seronegative spondyloarthropathies? Four seronegative spondyloarthropathies. And what does that mean? What is positive on labs? So how we can remember the four seronegative spondyloarthropathies is PAIR, P-A-I-R. P for psoriatic, A for ankylosing, spondylitis. I for IBD or IBD-involved arthritis, and R for reactive arthritis, especially to chlamydia. It's reactive to chlamydia. So P-A-I-R for those seronegative. And what does seronegative mean? It means it's negative ANA. So you're going to have a negative ANA with these arthropathies, but you will have a positive HLA B27. So the seronegative just means negative ANA, but we're going to have a positive HLA B27 with the pair. Okay, next one is a young male that has thick silvery scales with white plaques, nail pitting, and presents asking what his joint pain is from. What is it? So some classic things here, silvery scales with white plaques and also nail pitting, and he has joint pain as well. What's going to be classic on the radiograph of a patient with this condition? And what is the first line agent for this condition as well? So this is going to be, of course, psoriatic arthritis with those classic findings, again, silvery scales, nail pitting as well. And uh, on radiographs, we're going to see the classic pencil and cup deformity. And we also might find on physical exam sausage fingers. So sausage, sausage fingers, pencil and cup deformity, and this is psoriatic arthritis. 
first line agent, methotrexate, because it is an autoimmune condition. So we want to use methotrexate for that. Okay, next one is a 21-year-old male. He has lower back pain and trouble breathing now. He also has some eye inflammation. What is the likely diagnosis? <clears throat> what are some of the classic findings on x-ray? There's going to be two of them. And what will be tender on exam? And does it get worse or better with exercise? So a few things here. So 21-year-old male, so young male with low back pain and trouble breathing, also some eye inflammation. Two classic findings on x-ray, what's going to be tender on physical exam, and better or worse with exercise. So that's going to be ankylosing spondylitis. Ankylosing spondylitis, again, more common in young males, 15 to 30 years old. Bamboo spine is that classic finding on x-ray. And also SI joint narrowing, sacroiliac joint narrowing, is going to be found on x-ray. And it's also better with exercise. And also what's tender to palpation on exam, that's going to be also the SI joint, the sacroiliac joint. Okay, so young male has had urethritis two weeks ago. He now has conjunctivitis and arthritis. What is it? So urethritis, conjunctivitis, and arthritis. So another mnemonic I made to remember this one, that's going to be reactive. Oh. That's going to be reactive arthritis. So CUA, conjunctivitis, urethritis, and arthritis. What do we do next for this patient? What, common, what is the most common bug that causes this? And what is keratoderma blenorragicum? What is keratoderma blenorragicum? So like we said, reactive arthritis, CUA, conjunctivitis, urethritis, and arthritis. Also, we can do arthrocentesis to rule out a septic joint because they did have that previous infection. So you want to do arthrocentesis to rule out the septic joint. Chlamydia, trachomatis, is the most common bug to predispose to the reactive arthritis. And what is keratoderma blenorragicum? That's going to be hyperkeratotic lesions on the palms and soles. So hyperkeratotic lesions on the palms and soles. So what do you think of for AFP, alpha fetoprotein? What disease does alpha fetoprotein make you think of? So that's going to be hepatocellular carcinoma, most commonly hepatocellular carcinoma. Also non semitomatous germ cell testicular cancer, non semitomatous And also Down syndrome. AFP is Down and Down syndrome. How about, so getting into some of the tumor markers here, beta HCG. Beta HCG is also going to be elevated in non semitomatous germ cell testicular cancer. So remember, semitomatous versus non semitomatous Non is going to have more stuff with it. So it's going to be elevated with base beta HCG as well as AFP. And also for beta HCG, of course, choriocarcinoma and trophoblastic tumors as well. How about for CA125? What does CA125 make you think of? That's going to be, of course, ovarian cancer. And remember, we don't screen with that. We just follow the disease progression with that CA125. How about CA199? What does CA199 make you think of? CA199, of course, pancreatic cancer. How about calcitonin that's elevated? And they have an absence of any other electrolyte abnormalities like hypercalcemia or anything like that. So just a, just a solo elevated calcitonin. That's going to make you think of medullary thyroid carcinoma. So medullary thyroid carcinoma for elevated calcitonin. CEA, carcinoembryonic antigen. What does that make you think of? Gastric and colorectal cancer for CEA. PSA, that's pretty obvious. Prostate-specific antigen is, of course, going to be prostate cancer. So what is the difference between gout and pseudogout? on arthrocentesis. So what's the difference between gout and pseudogout on arthrocentesis? Is uric acid used to make a definitive diagnosis of gout? So should we actually use that uric acid level to make a definitive diagnosis for gout? And what are the three best methods, or what are the three best meds for acute gout, not chronic? <clears throat> what's the mechanism of action of allopurinol? And how about probenicid? So a few things. What's the MOA of allopurinol, probenicid, what are the three best meds for acute? Should we use uric acid to make the diagnosis? And what do we see as a difference between gout and pseudogout on arthrocentesis? So our meds are colchicine, corticosteroids and NSAIDs for acute gout, 
allopurinol is a xanthine oxidase inhibitor. So it inhibits the breakdown and the accumulation of those purines that end up predisposing us to the gout. And probenicid is a uricosuric. So it helps just pee out basically all that extra uric acid. And we also asked, which I didn't write down, what's the difference between gout and pseudogout on arthrosynthesis? Remember, gout is going to have those negatively birefringent crystals, those like spike-shaped crystals that they might give you a picture of. So for gout, negatively birefringent on arthrosynthesis. And for pseudogout, it's going to be weakly positive uh, birefringent on uh, arthrosynthesis. And they're also, um, they're also like quadrangular in shape, pseudogout. Okay, next one is what meds increase the risk of gout? So it might give you a med, and you have to know that it increases the risk. So what med increases the risk of gout? That's going to be remembered by DAN, D-A-N, diuretics, aspirin, and niacin. So diuretics could be loop or uh, thiazides, especially thiazides, ASA, and niacin. What is the name of the crystals of gout, which we already said, and how about pseudogout? So name those crystals of gout and pseudogout. When do you not initiate chronic gout meds management? When do you not initiate these chronic gout management? So monosodium urate crystals, which are negatively birefringent, and calcium pyrophosphate rhomboid-shaped crystals, so not quadrangular, but rhomboid-shaped crystals in uh, calcium pyrophosphate deposition disorder. And not an acute attack, so we don't want to initiate chronic gout management in an acute gout attack because it could precipitate even an increase in gout. So we want to wait till that attack is over or a few days after that. So what's the difference between what's the difference between Stills disease, which is systemic rheumatoid arthritis, and oligoarticular rheumatoid arthritis? So Stills disease, which is the systemic form, and oligoarticular arthritis. And these are all uh, juvenile um, idiopathic arthropathies. So oligo will have a uveitis or iridocyclitis associated with it, and you definitely need to get that ophthalmologic exam. So you need to send them to ophthalmology. So oligo will have the uveitis and iridocyclitis needing eye exams, whereas Stills disease, the systemic form, has that salmon-colored pink migratory rash with daily high fevers. <clears throat> so more broad symptoms. And both are under the age of 16 years old, so juvenile. So just remember, oligo is the one that has uveitis and iridocyclitis, so involving the eyes. Whereas systemic, again, pink salmon-colored migratory rash with high fevers daily. Okay, patient with a history of gout has nodules on his ear. What is it? So patient with gout, long-standing gout, has nodules on his ear. What is it? And what would we also see classically on x-ray of a patient with gout? So what would we see classically on x-ray with gout? And what are the nodules on his ears? So that's going to be TOFI. So those are going to be um, uric acid like deposition built up over time. So gouty TOFI and also rat bite lesions where the bone is kind of eroded away. We can see that on x-ray. So they're called rat bite lesions on x-ray. So next one, we're just going to go over um, associated antibodies with their disease association because sometimes in the vignette they might give you um, very general symptoms for a rheumatologic condition or any other condition and they might sprinkle in one of these antibodies here and expect you to know what it is automatically so <clears throat> we'll just go through some of those so I'll, I'll say the antibody and see if you can think of what the disease associated with it is so ANA so that's a very general one so again non-specific SLE autoimmune hepatitis ANA will be positive in a lot of these ones, except which, which ones, which we went over. That's going to be the PAIR, P-A-I-R, psoriatic, ankylosing, um, IBD-associated arthritis, and reactive arthritis, and those are the HLA B27 positive ones. Okay, how about anti-CCP? Anti-CCP, that's going to be RA. How about rheumatoid factor? Rheumatoid factor, of course, rheumatoid arthritis. How about anti-DS DNA? What does that make you think of, anti-DS DNA? That's going to be SLE. Antihistones. Remember we said antihistones? That's going to be drug-induced SLE. And do remember what the mnemonic was for all the drugs that do induce SLE? 
that's going to be HIPQ. So remember, antihistones and HIPQ, hydralazine, isoniazid, um, parazinamide, procainamide, and quinidine. So HIPQ for drug-induced SLE for antihistone. How about anti-JO1? So we went over that one, anti-JO1. That's going to be polio or polymyositis or dermatomyositis. So they both have an elevation in those. And do we remember which one differentiates between that? So we said polymyositis has what? And dermatomyositis has what? They both have anti-JO, but dermatomyositis is going to have the, the MY2 elevation, whereas polymyositis won't. And I believe polymyositis has that SRP, signal recognition protein. So that's how you can differentiate from them if they give you both. The anti-JO, similar symptoms, but they give you one of those specific antibodies um, that we just said respectively for each condition. So anti-mitochondrial, AMA. That's going to be PBC, primary, primary biliary cirrhosis, anti-mitochondrial. So I always get that mixed up, anti-mitochondrial with anti-smooth muscle antibodies. So anti-smooth muscle, that's going to be autoimmune hepatitis. But primary biliary cirrhosis, PBC, that's going to be anti-mitochondrial antibodies. Okay, we don't need to know those. Anti-centromere, like we just said a few minutes ago, anti-centromeres with Crest syndrome. How about anti-SCL70? Anti-SCL70 is going to be scleroderma, systemic scleroderma. Anti-SM, Smith, anti-Smith, again, SLE. Anti-Rho and La, so anti-Rho and La, SSA and SSB, Rho and La, that's going to be Sjogren syndrome. Anti-thyroid stimulating hormone receptors. That's going to be, think about it, thyroid stimulating. So it's going to be Graves' disease because we're having hyperthyroidism. For C. anca, what's C. anca going to make you think of? So there's a few with C. anca, but definitely Wegner's granulomatosis. Remember we said the G in Wegner's granulomatosis looks like a C, so C. anca. And also a bunch of random vasculitides as well for C. anca. P. anca, what does that make you think of? There was a bunch that we went over with P. anca positivity. PANC is also going to be a bunch of different vasculitides, <clears throat> as well as microscopic polyangiitis. We said um, polyarteritis nodosa as well. Okay, endomycial antibodies and TGA, tissue transglutaminase. What are those going to be? That's going to be for celiac disease. And then, like we said, anti-GBM. Which one is anti-GBM? Glomerular basement membrane antibodies. That's going to be good pasture syndrome. So those are just a few of them, not all of them, that we should know. Okay, now moving on to osteoporosis. So what are the secondary causes of osteoporosis? What are the secondary causes of osteoporosis? What level of DEXA scan density for osteoporosis is diagnostic? And where is the most common fracture in osteoporosis? So some of the secondary causes of osteoporosis will be Cushing's disease, um, chronic and exogenous steroid use, so corticosteroid use, same thing as Cushing's, but Cushing's is endogenous. Levothyroxine, although it could be put on by exogenous. So levothyroxine as well for secondary causes of osteoporosis. Lithium can be a cause. Phenytoin can be a cause. Diabetes mellitus can be a cause, as well as low estrogen can be a cause. And what's the diagnosis for DEXA density for osteoporosis? That's going to be negative 1 to negative 2.5 is osteopenia, and negative 2.5 and greater is osteoporosis. So negative 1 to negative 2.5 is osteopenia, and greater than 2.5 is prosis. The most common fracture in osteoporosis, that's going to be a vertebral fracture. So just think about the old lady gets up from the chair, and she has a pain in her back vertebral fracture. What five agents can we treat medically with osteoporosis? What are five agents we can use to treat medically? And is osteoporosis more common in thin or obese people? So that's a good one. Thinner or obese people are more common to have osteoporosis. So first line is bisphosphonates. Bisphosphonates. We can also use denosumab. We can use teriparatide, a synthetic PTH analog. Raloxifene. A CIRM, and we can also use calcitonin. 
And of course, we need to give vitamin D. Sometimes they ask you the dose. So vitamin D, how much? 800 a day for vitamin D, um, international units, and 1,500 of calcium per day. And thin people are more at risk of osteoporosis. So if you think about it, the increased BMI puts a lot of stress on those bones, so they're forced to rebuild and uh, strengthen themselves. So obese people actually have slightly, they can have slightly stronger bones and are at less risk for osteoporosis. Next one is where is the most common herniated disc? So where is the most common herniated disc located? And what exactly is being herniated? What specific anatomic structure? What will the effects be resulting from L4, L5, and S1? So sometimes they might give you a symptom and you have to know, is it L4, L5, or S1 of the nerve root that is affecting this? So the most common location I got for this source is the L5 through S1, um, but some say it's L4 and L5 as the most common. However, herniated disc, it makes sense that this would be the most common L5 to S1 because it's that relatively immobile sacrum and the, um, the lumbar vertebrae, which are more mobile than the sacrum. So it makes sense that it kind of pops out there and that anatomical structure that we just asked, that's going to be the nucleus pulposus. So the pulp inside the, the disc is herniating through the annulus, the ring, annulus, fibrosis. So a fibrous ring is outside and the pulp is inside. That pulp comes through and herniates through. So for L4, they're going to have a decreased knee patella reflex kicking out. They're going to have decreased sensation on the medial side of the leg and the foot, the medial side, as well as the anterior thigh. They can have some pain there and also decreased ankle dorsiflexion. For L5, they'll have decreased big toe dorsiflexion, just the big toe. Pain on the back of the foot with decreased strength and no reflex loss. So L5 isn't really indicative of any reflex loss per se. S1 will be a lateral foot. Um, loss of eversion. So that'll be that peroneal nerve that controls that eversion. Loss of plantar flexion and also loss of the ankle jerk, Achilles reflex. So the important thing to know is L5 doesn't really have a reflex. S1 is really going down. L4 is really going up as well as the knee. So the patient comes in with decreased sensation over the medial thigh and groin. They also report incontinence, importantly, and back pain. He also admits to IV drug use and has a temperature of 103. What's the likely diagnosis for this patient? So a few pathognomonic things, medial thigh and groin, incontinence and back pain, also IV drug use and a temp. That's going to be caught at equina, and this is likely due to a tumor compression or IV drug use could be an abscess, tumor compression of S2 to S4 nerve root. It's the most common is disc herniation to have this, where just a massive herniation obstructs all those nerve roots. But the tumor can also cause uh, stenosis from an abscess like this guy with IV drug use, as well as trauma. And pathognomonic is bowel and bladder incontinence and decreased anal sphincter tone. So they can't really fake decreased anal sphincter tone. So important things to test for if you're concerned about cauda equina syndrome. And what is the treatment? Treatment of cauda equina is, of course, emergent surgical decompression. So this is a big emergency that you have to get handled right away. So a patient presents with pain after jumping from a large height. They landed normally on their feet. What are you concerned for? So they have pain after jumping from a large height, and they also landed normally on their feet. In whom is this most common? And what are the risk factors? So a little bit general question here, but who is this most common and what are the risk factors? So they have that back pain after a large height, and that's going to be vertebral compression fracture. Just think all that force radiating up from both legs through the back, and if they have some weak, weak vertebrae there, especially due to elderly from osteoporosis, that could cause a vertebral compression fracture. The risk factors for this include pathologic states, of course, like multiple myeloma, prostate cancer, and other systemic illnesses, diabetes, hypertension. The elderly patient, the next case is the elderly patient that insists upon leaning over their shopping cart, leaning over their shopping cart when food shopping. They say it hurts when they try to stand tall. What are they likely dealing with? So this is an elderly person, <laughs> elderly person that wants to lean over their shopping cart when they're food shopping. And they have pain when they try to extend their back fully. Does Valsalva worsen this condition or not? 
and what is the best test for this condition. So that's going to be, of course, especially in the elderly, spinal stenosis. Valsalva does not worsen the condition as it would in a herniated disc. So think about in a herniated, so this is into, inter, um, in the intervertebral column. So Valsalva and that pressure is not going to really affect it as much as opposed to a herniated disc. When we increase the intra-abdominal pressure, that could potentially push on the herniated disc more, causing more radicular symptoms. So herniated disc, Valsalva is going to worsen, but for spinal stenosis, it's not. And also, of course, an MRI is going to be the best. So we're going to see the stenosis inside that vertebral column there. How long should you prescribe bed rest for a lumbar sprain or strain? So what is the maximum time they can have actually some bed rest for a lumbar sprain or strain? What will be found on physical exam for a lumbar sprain or strain? So interestingly, two days at most of bed rest, you don't want them getting too stiff. You want them to continue their regular daily activities as tolerated. And what will be found on physical exam for a lumbar sprain or strain? That's going to be paraspinal muscular tenderness. So the muscles that run up and down parallel to the spine, basically. No neuro symptoms, and this is due to a muscle spasm. So they could use cyclobenzaprine or something like that, physical therapy, NSAIDs. A diabetic patient that has a fever and back pain, they're also an IV drug user. What do you want to think of? First thing you think of. So diabetic, fever and back pain, IV drug user. What do you think? What's the most common cause of this? And tuberculosis of the spine is called what? So that kind of gives it away a little bit. Tuberculosis of the spine is called what? And also what will be evident on physical exam? What's evident on physical exam in this condition? So that's going to be an epidural abscess. So around the epidural, in the epidura, that's going to be an abscess forming multiple risk factors. Think about it, diabetes, having increased glucose, impaired um, vasculature, IV drug user especially, and they have fever and back pain. So that's going to be an epidural abscess. We can't miss this. Staph aureus is the most common cause. And TB of the spine is going to be POTS disease. So it's important to know POTS disease as TB of the spine. And on physical exam, they'll have neuro symptoms, of course, like bowel bladder incontinence, myelopathy, radiculopathy, severe and focal back pain. So severe and focal back pain. So quadraquina may not have severe and focal back pain, but again, quadraquina can be from many different causes. So this could be one of the causes of it. But specifically, this person has that fever, they're diabetic, they have IV drug use. So you want to be thinking of that abscess in that situation. What is the best um, test and treatment? So what is the best test and treatment for this epidural abscess? You want to get an MRI. You want to cover staph aureus, <clears throat> aspirate, aspiration, and drainage. So this can be done by VANC and ceftriaxone. So remember, VANC is a powerful gram-positive coverage, and ceftriaxone has good CNS penetration or cefotaxime. So it covers a little bit gram negatives too. And add a fourth gen if pseudomonas is suspected, like cefepime. What's the most common type of scoliosis, and what are the criteria for scoliosis? What's the most common type, and what are the criteria? A few questions on scoliosis here. How do we screen for scoliosis? How do we confirm scoliosis? What is a Reiser score? When do we observe scoliosis? When do we brace them? Or when do we do surgery? So there's specific criteria for each of those. So the criteria to diagnose it in the first place that's going to be AIS, adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. They have to be two things for 10, over 10 years old and an over 10 degree Cobb angle. That's going to be idiopathic. You should do the, to screen, the Adams forward bend test, which is having them bend over, see if there's any abnormal curvature in the spine, see if there's any prominence on one side while they're actually bending. And then after the Adams forward bend test, you can go to the scoliometer, the scoliometer, and that's over seven degrees. So if you see over 70 deg seven degrees, you can then associate that with a specific Cobb angle too. So there's some association with the scoliometer being over seven degrees and a certain Cobb angle. How do we confirm? This is gonna be by getting an X-ray and looking at the Cobb angle. So like we said, it needs to be over 10 degrees in over 10 year old patients, unless it's a secondary cause. Cobb is over 10 degrees, it's confirmatory. 
What is the Reiser score? The Reiser score is iliac crest ossification. So 5 is almost completely ossified and 0 is completely immature. So Reiser score 0 to 5, maturity of the iliac crest ossification, tells us how much growth is left. So for instance, if they have a, if you're considering brace, let's say they have a 29 Cobb angle, but they have a 5 Reiser score, that means their iliac crests are pretty mature. That means they have very little growth left. So even though they have 29, you might not brace in that scenario because you have to take into consideration the maturity of how much growth they have left. So how do we know when to brace, when to observe, and when to do surgery? So under 25, you keep following up unless a greater than 5 degree curvature increase in 3 to 6 months when you're following them up, and then you have to brace them. And like we said, you also want to consider the Reiser score in that scenario. So bracing is usually 30 to 39, but if they're not skeletally mature, surgery if a Cobb angle is over 40 with a Reiser of 0 to 2. So that makes sense. If you have a Cobb over 40, they're already pretty severe, and they have a Reiser of 0 to 2, so they have a lot of growth to go. So they could, they could continue to spiral out of control into an even poorer Cobb angle. But just remember, if you can remember bracing 30 to 39, you'll know that anything greater than bracing is likely surgery. Anything less than bracing at 30, it's probably going to be observed in three to six month intervals. Okay, so when a patient rotates their head to the side and lifts the arm, they seem to lose the radial pulse and feel tingling under their arm. What is, what is this test that you just described and what... Um, what the patient is doing and what is the diagnosis. <clears throat> so they lift their arm, they lose their radial pulse, and they have paresthesias and tingling under their arm. That's the ADSENS sign. The ADSENS sign, and this is for thoracic outlet syndrome. So thoracic outlet syndrome, it, it leads to ulnar neuropathy and compression of the brachial plexus and also the artery and vein in that same area. So that's why we lose the radial pulse. We're basically cinching off the arterial flow so we're going to lose that pulse a little bit, and also the ulnar neuropathy leading to that paresthesias under the arm. Here's an important one. What is the difference between spondylolisthesis and spondylolysis? So what's the difference, can you describe, between spondylolisthesis and spondylolysis? Where is the defect in spondylolysis? Where is it located? And what is the classic sign we see on x-ray of spondylolysis? So um, spondylolisthesis is forward translation of the vertebrae on the vertebrae. So one vertebrae is actually translated either forward or backwards based on the other one. So it's also graded one to four. You don't have to remember, but it's just helpful to know that spondylolisthesis is a translation. So 25% will be one, two, three, four, 25, 50, 75, and 100%. So spondylolisthesis can be graded, and it's that forward translation. Um, versus spondylolysis, which is a defect, a fracture in that pars interarticularis of the pedicle. And the classic sign we see is the Scotty Dog sign. So we see that Scotty Dog sign, it'll look like supposedly a Scotty Dog, and it, the collar of the Scotty Dog will show. If there is a collar of the Scotty Dog, that means we have a fracture of the pars ar in, ar interarticularis. Um, so that'll be a radiolucent collar, which is how you identify it. And it, also important to know, it's on the oblique film. So you have to know kind of what film you would even look to see this in the first place. Next one is a young male that was playing basketball, and someone hit his arm after he went for a shot, and his arm was in external rotation and abduction. He now presents with very limited range of motion. What likely happened? So again, external rotation, playing basketball, somebody hit his arm, and now he can't really move his arm. What probably happened? Which is the most common form of this? What are the two radiographic views we should get? It's a very important. What are the two radiographic views? What are two lesions, or bony lesions, I should say? What are two bony lesions associated with this, and where are they located? And what nerve is likely to be damaged? So all important questions here. So of course, this is going to be an anterior shoulder dislocation. So classic for anterior shoulder dislocation to be externally rotated and abducted especially when throwing a ball, when going up for a shot in basketball, etc. Anterior is the most common, like 90 to 95% are anterior shoulder dislocations. 
and you should get the Y view. So if you get the Y view, that helps you know definitively between anterior versus posterior. If you just get one view, whether it's the lateral or the AP, that doesn't really give you enough information to make a definitive diagnosis based on radiographs if it's anterior or posterior dislocation. So some of the radiograph, some of the lesions that you'll notice, the bony lesions, are a Bankart lesion, which is on the glenoid, and it could be also due to the could be a fracture of actually the glenoid or a, um, just the labrum. So when that humeral head comes off in a dislocation, it can damage that labrum or the glenoid itself. So that's a bank heart. I think of it as the bank is that your glenoid because that's really what holds everything. So your glenoid holds everything. So I think bank heart lesion. And hill sacs lesion is on the humeral head. So that's easy because hill sacs, you can remember H for H, humeral, hill sacs, or it's the, glumer, the uh, humeral head looks like a hill anyways. So hill sacs lesion is like a basically a fracture or a impaction due to the dislocation. So you want to see hill sacs and bank heart lesions when you see the dislocation. And again, posterior is the only, posterior is so rare, it's only five to 10%, but it's usually due to electrocution or a seizure. So, and it's gonna be adducted and internally rotated. So just the opposite of uh, the anterior shoulder dislocation. And what nerve is likely to have damage? Of course, the axillary nerve is gonna have damage. The axillary nerve runs around the humeral head from underneath and posterior. So you wanna check the pinprick sensation to the deltoid and look for that squared off appearance as well. So you'll notice like the AC joint and below it is a massive step off because the shoulder's either anterior or posterior at that point. So next one is when adducting and crossing the arm over the body medially, the patient feels pain at the tip of their shoulder. They recently fell in football with their arm across their body. What is the likely diagnosis? So again, arm across their body twice is causing them a lot of pain. They feel pain at the tip of their shoulder, superiorly, and they fell recently. And what are the three stages of this injury? What are the three stages of this injury? So this is gonna be an AC joint separation, a chromioclavicular joint separation. So a grade one is just the ligament is sprained. So just the AC joint is sprained. A grade two is an AC joint rupture and a coracoclavicular joint sprain. And grade three is coracoclavicular joint and AC joint rupture. So it just progresses from there. And they might tell you the radiograph or the MRI shows um, coracoclavicular is sprained and AC joint is ruptured. What is this? And you'd have to know, is it one, two, or three? So next one is a 50-year-old painter who presents with shoulder pain worse at night you also see him shrugging his shoulder to compensate when you ask him to do active range of motion. But when he does passive range of motion, when you do it for him, basically, he's fine. What do you think of? So he just has this weakness. He's compensating with that shoulder shrugging. He's a painter, so he does a lot of overhead activities. And he has problems with active range of motion, meaning he can't do it himself. But when you passively rotate for him, he's fine. What is this? What is the most common structure involved in this? What are two ways this can occur? So there's two major categories for how this can occur. And what are the four most common tests that can be done for this? So this is of course gonna be a rotator cuff tear, the muscles around the humeral head that support it both anterior, posterior, superiorly. Overhead activity <clears throat> predisposes to this. So this guy was a painter. He was painting with his hand over his head for his whole life. Shoulder weakness and active range of motion. So it's a lot of just weakness in this. And the supraspinatus is the most common. So remember the supraspinatus kind of slides under that acromial, acromial clavicular joint, and it can easily get impinged over time, especially with overhead activities. It can lead to fraying, inflammation of that tendon, and it can rupture over time. And that's again, part of your rotator cuff is your SITS muscles. So remember what SITS stands for. Supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, and subscapularis, not teres major, right? So again, young, they can be young and it can be a traumatic event, or it could be old and degenerative like this patient who's a painter. So you wanna do the near test, you wanna do the Hawkins test, 
You can do the drop arm test, and you can do the empty can test, which is most specific. So you can do near Hawkins drop arm and empty can test, but empty can is the most specific. And also, if you want to differentiate it from a tendinopathy but, um, versus a cuff tear, you can do the lidocaine subacromial test. So you're injecting lidocaine under there, and um, if they get better with it, then you think that it's probably just some acromial compression and tendinopathy under there. But if they don't get better and they still have that weakness, probably a cuff tear. 65-year-old female recently recovered from metastatic breast cancer. She thinks she presents with acute shoulder and upper arm pain. What would you be thinking of? So this is one they always ask. So she had metastatic breast cancer. Now she has acute shoulder, upper arm pain. What do you think is going on? So proximal humeral fracture, a pathologic proximal humeral fracture. So next one is the patient has an inability to extend the wrist after falling on outstretched hand and complains of upper arm pain. What nerve is likely injured and where is the fract fracture likely? So upper arm pain, what nerve, where is the fracture? Inability to extend the wrist. Inability to extend the wrist after falling on the outstretched hand. So it's going to be radial nerve and humerus fracture. So the radial nerve, it courses posteriorly around the humerus, especially the middle humerus, even a little bit lower of the posterior humerus and the wrist and leads to wrist drop because the, uh, we know the radial nerve um, innervates those extensor tendons. So when you ask the patient to push against, they're not going to be able to do it. They're just going to have wrist drop. 45-year-old woman on levothyroxine and metformin presents with shoulder stiffness for three months. She complains it's worse at night and can't often reach to dry her hair. What is the likely diagnosis? So levo and metformin, stiffness for about three months, worse at night, can't really reach her hair. You want us to be thinking of frozen shoulder. So that's also adhesive capsulitis. So frozen shoulder, adhesive capsulitis, and your goal is to increase the range of motion in these patients. You can do, if it's refractory, to conservative uh, physical therapy, NSAIDs. You can do a manipulation under anesthesia to kind of break up that tissue there and increase the range of motion. Where is the most common area of the clavicle to be fractured? What newborn complication is associated with clavicle fracture? So that's going to be the, med the middle, I should say. The middle one-third of the uh, clavicle is the most common area to be fractured. And if you have a proximal one-third fracture of the clavicle, you need to get an orthopedic evaluation because it typically takes a higher impact trauma to injure that area. So you want to get an uh, orthopedic consult for that. But the middle one-third is the most common. And also remember, back to the OBGYN unit, shoulder dystocia and herbs palsy can result from that clavicle fracture. So having a hard time getting the baby out, we can end up fracturing the clavicle, damaging the brachial plexus, leading to that waiter tip deformity, which is also called herbs palsy. Okay, so on x-ray, you notice an anterior and posterior fat pad around the elbow. What is the significance of this? What line do we want to look for on x-ray so that we know something's going on? And what are two complications of this injury? What are two complications? And we have to differentiate, really, is this an adult or a kid? So it's going to be a supracondylar fracture in kids. And in adults, it's a radial head fracture. So you definitely want to make that distinction. Supracondylar fracture in kids, radial head fracture in adults. The anterior humeral line, as it should be perpendicular from the radiocapitellar line, as it should dissect the capitellum. So remember the difference between the capitellum and the coronoid process. So they sit together, and you should see a perpendicular line crossing them. So if not, then there could be a fracture there. And complication would be Volkmann contracture from the median nerve injury. So that's like a clawed deformity from the ischemia and contraction. You could also have radial nerve damage as well. So Volkmann contracture, medium nerve injury. So remember the median nerve, those first three and a half digits starting at the thumb, Volkmann contracture, contracting in. The last two may be okay, though. An adult has had a Fouche injury fall on the outstretched hand. 
and there is an anterior sail sign, and she cannot fully extend the elbow or supinate and pronate well. What is the most likely injury and what criteria should determine your management? So we kind of alluded to this one. Again, radial head we're most concerned for because she fell on the outstretched hand. She has that anterior fat pad sign or sail sign, meaning there's an effusion around the area. It could be hemarthrosis. And she cannot fully extend the elbow or supinate and pronate well. So what, what function is that? That's going to be the radial head. So remember the radial head's kind of like a circular part of the bone where it just kind of rotates. It allows for that supination and pronation. So if she can't do that, likely has a radial head injury. And especially since it's an adult as well. And what criteria? You want to use the Mason criteria. So Mason criteria just shows the severity of the radial head injury. Is it through the neck of the is it through the radial neck? Is it vertically through the radial head? Is it completely comminuted? and other things. So Mason criteria will give you that ability to manage it correctly. So next patient is a patient that presents with a finger held in flexion. They have tenderness to the tendon sheath. They also have an enlarged finger and they also report it's painful to extend that finger. What is her condition? So again, held in flexion, tenderness to the tendon sheath, it's enlarged overall, and it's painful to extend it. So she's holding it in flexion, can't really extend it. What's the most common cause? What's the most likely cause? So that's gonna be separative flexor tenosynovitis. Separative flexor tenosynovitis, most common cause is staph aureus. And how you can remember this is the Cannavel sign, K-flex. So we gave you all of the K-flex mnemonic in this um, vignette. So flexion, painful at the sheath, enlarged, and painful to extend. Separative flexor tenosynovitis. Okay, next one. Patient has paresthesias to her fifth carpal and cannot extend the elbow at all after a fall. What is her injury likely and what nerve is injured? So this is a good one. So fifth carpal, but she can't extend her elbow too. So what's going on there? That's going to be a lecranon fracture. So remember, a lecranon where the triceps attaches to distally. And ulnar nerve is the most common nerve injured. So remember, ulnar nerve goes under the medial epicondyle. So if you're injured to the olecranon, you're going to have swelling, hemarthrosis in that area. So that could occlude the ulnar nerve there. And of course, she's not going to be able to extend it because if you're having an olecranon fracture, you're likely damaging the insertion of the triceps there. So you're going to have a lot of pain or complete inability to extend it. So ulnar nerve injury, remember the ulnar nerve traces down to the fourth and fifth um, carpals there. So that's where that injury is. So what do you think of if the patient has a classic goose egg on the elbow? So it's a young patient, they have a goose egg on the elbow, and uh, it can be inflammatory or not. That's olecranon bursitis. So just the bursa on the elbow basically gets inflamed from repeated trauma or just friction or something. It can be inflammatory too. Next patient has a radial head dislocation and a proximal ulnar fracture. What is this? So radial head dislocation and a proximal ulnar fracture. What is this? That's going to be classic. Montasia fracture. That's going to be Montasia. How I remember this always is M equals F-U-D-R. So Montasia equals fracture of the ulna and dislocation of the radius. M equals F-U-D-R. <laughs> So Galeazzi, if you know one, then you don't really have to have a mnemonic for the other. Um, so Galeazzi is just the opposite. So it's a fracture of the radius and a dislocation of the ulna. So fracture of the radius, dislocation of the ulna. And remember, the ulna is much more narrow distally. So that's where you're going to have that dislocation. Next one is a mom that was swinging her three-year-old daughter, <laughs> daughter around by her hands and suddenly the kid experienced pain and holds her elbow. What's the likely diagnosis? So three-year-old, she's getting swung around with her hands. What ligament is displaced? So what is the specific ligament that is displaced in this condition? How do we reduce this? So of course, very classic one, always asked, nursemaid's elbow. Nursemaid's elbow, the annular ligament and hyperpronation which is preferred, but you can also do supination and flexion. So sometimes they'll even make you choose between hyperpronation 
and the supination inflection. So actually, if you have to choose, hyperpronation has been the correct answer. And uh, supination inflection, that's fine too. But So next one is a patient that's a hairdresser and continually complains of pain on the outside of her elbow that is worse at the end of the workday. What does she have? So this is an easy one. What structure is involved here? So what is the actual structure involved? That's going to be lateral epicondylitis or tennis elbow. And this is the extensor tendons. So this is the extensor carpi radialis brevis tendon insertion. So the extensor mechanism on the lateral side, the carpi extends the hands, radialis on the radial side. And it's the shorter one as opposed to the longest. Flexion against the resistance of the wrist causes the patient pain. What is this? So flexion against resistance of the wrist. That's going to be the opposite. So golfer's elbow or medial epicondylitis. Okay, next one. Which type of elbow dislocation is most common? So what type of elbow dislocation is most common? How can you tell? What fracture is associated with this injury? And what must you emergently do if you have this elbow dislocation? So again, which type is most common? How can you tell? What fracture is associated with it? What must you emergently do? So posterior is most common, which makes sense. I mean, it'd be kind of hard for the olecranon to come anteriorly around the whole distal humerus. So posterior is most common. You can tell based on the humerus. So is it anterior or posterior to the humerus? So we always go based on, so it might, might be hard to tell based on the radiograph, but if you always go based on what is the proximal limb, then you can know what the distal limb's doing and whether it's anterior or posterior. And you always want, like, like we said, always go by the proximal structure. And the coronoid fracture is most common in this. So remember the coronoid abuts the distal humerus. So you don't want to make this mix this up with the conoid. Remember the conoid and the trapezoid up in the shoulder trapezoid ligament, and the coracoid process as well. So you don't want to mix those up. That's conoid fracture. Must emergently reduce and check the neurovascular status. So you want to definitely check the neurovascular status. There's so many nerves and veins and arteries in that area. So you want to reduce this quickly and make sure you check the neurovascular status before and after. What two physical exams can help you diagnose cubital tunnel syndrome? So cubital tunnel syndrome. So that's going to be the froment sign, which we'll describe, and also the tineal sign over the ulnar nerve. So again, cubital tunnel syndrome, that ulnar neuropathy where it gets caught um, up near the medial epicondyle, and froment sign is going to help you to determine that, as well as just tapping on it, and that's the tineal sign like we said we can do with carpal tunnel, as well as uh, tarsal tunnel syndrome. So froment sign, I brought in a picture here because it's kind of hard to... Um, describe. So basically, because the ulnar, the ulnar nerve comes down the bottom side of the, the ulnar side, obviously, of the hand here, it actually comes across and attaches to part of the thumb. So normally you're able, your thumb, and it contracts this muscle here, so normally your thumb's going to be able to squeeze this piece of paper fully. So without that ability of the thumb here, it's going to compensate by contracting distally here to press on the paper like that. So if you see that peaking, of that DIP, then that's a positive froment sign because we're having lack of contraction here on the palmar aspect of the thumb as the ulnar nerve comes across, and you're pinching with this distal aspect here. That's going to be a positive froment, as you can see here. So they're really having that inability to contract uh, proximally here. So again, just to talk through it, adductor pollicis comes across the hand and innervates that thumb movement. So that's the adductor. So it's adding the thumb to the middle of the hand, adductor pollicis. Without that, the DIP will bend because the thumb cannot press down on the paper, as we said. Okay, so next one. The patient had a foosh fall on the outstretched hand and now has pain at the anatomical snuff box. He thinks it is not as bad and insists that only NSAIDs will be fine since the x-ray is negative. Is this okay? Explain to him why this is risky. And what is the proper treatment for this condition? So this is going to be classic, the scaphoid fracture. So they always give you a vignette of somebody comes in with mild pain, 
they have pain at the anatomical snuff box and they want to go home, are you going to let them go home or what is your management going to be? So again, scaphoid fracture, 65% are at the waist of the bone, so the middle of the scaphoid. Scaphoid kind of looks like a kidney bean, so most of them at, are at the middle. And typically right away when they come to the ER, a radiograph can be negative. The radiograph can be negative initially, but because the blood supply is so tenuous in that area because it comes from distal to proximal, avascular necrosis is a high risk as well as non-union. So you can't do so you can't just let them go home without anything. So you need a thumb spike, a sprint, splint, and follow-up. You can do a repeated x-ray in like two weeks, which will potentially be positive at that point. But if you have a strong suspicion, you can even do an MRI. So like we said, the fracture may not be seen for two weeks. And don't forget the blood flow of the scaphoid. So we talked about this with the Jones fracture as well, and also with the navicular. So there's a few bones that have this weird blood supply that goes around it and comes in distal to proximal. And those are the type of bones that have a higher risk of non-union and avascular necrosis. And this one, falling the outstretched hand at the anatomical snuff box is just a classic example of that, that we need to always treat even if their x-ray is negative. Okay, next one. What is a Terry Thomas sign? What is a Terry Thomas sign? So that's going to be widened scaphalunate space. So I couldn't really describe that one, so I just brought a picture here, a widened scaphalunate space. So here you have the scaphoid, that kidney bean structure, and here's the widened space in between it, and here's the lunate bone. And triquetrum, pisiform. So here's the scaphoid, lunate, and here's that widening space, and that's called the Terry Thomas sign. So next one, a patient was born with a deficiency in type 1 collagen and has blue sclera, and also their parents report frequent fractures without even doing anything. They also state he cannot hear and would like an evaluation for autism. What is this going to be? So he can't hear, he's having trouble here, they think it's autism. He's had frequent fractures, and he has blue sclera. That's going to be osteogenesis imperfecta. So remember those classic findings, blue sclera. It's a type 1 collagen deficiency, so type 1 collagen is bone. Um, they have re recurrent fractures without even doing much, and they can't hear because the auditory ossicles are bones, so those fail to develop properly. Next one, explain the difference between a Collies and a Smith fracture. So what's the difference between a Collies and a Smith fracture? And also, what is a Barton fracture? Also, what is a Barton fracture? So a Barton fracture is a radial styloid fracture. So radial styloid, that's just the point on the end of the radius going through that. That's a Barton fracture. And a Collies fracture is that dinner fork deformity that's dorsally. So dorsally angulated Collies fracture like this. Smith's is a ventral fracture. So it's a Collies, but the opposite way. And that's the garden spade deformity. So Smith's is in like this, ventrally. And these likely have to be reduced and sometimes pinned. Explain the difference between lunate in a perilunate dislocation. So what's the difference between lunate and perilunate dislocation? So they might give you a radiograph, show you and say, is this lunate or perilunate, or they might describe it. So lunate is the, lunate is the middle proximal bone that pops out. So lunate dislocation is just the lunate that pops out. Everything else is in line still. Perilunate is the lunate is fine, it's still in place, but the rest of the distal hand is dislocated. So everything that is peri or around the lunate gets dislocated. So pretty easy. Lunate is just the lunate bone, and perilunate is everything around it distally that is uh, dislocated. What is Kindbox disease? So what is Kindbox disease? Kindbox disease is avascular necrosis of the lunate bone. And this is very serious because the lunate occupies two-thirds of the radial articular surface. So it articulates with the radius. It's two-thirds of that whole entire surface. So if you have avascular necrosis here, that's pretty serious. So that's Kindbox disease, avascular necrosis of the lunate. So next one, patient comes in, and he has a history of a fracture of the tibia two years ago, and also has increased sensation of pain with intermittent edema and sweating with temperature derangements on and off. So kind of weird symptoms. She also notes skin color changes. What is this diagnosis? And what can be given after the fracture for prophylaxis against this condition? So again, classic symptoms are 
a fracture in the distant past, tibial fracture two years ago, increased sensation of pain, hyperalgesia, with intermittent edema, and sweating with temperature derangements on and off in skin color changes. So what is that? So that's CRPS, chronic regional pain syndrome or complex regional pain syndrome. And vitamin C can be given prophylaxis for this. So I used to get that one wrong a lot. Cro complex regional pain syndrome, all these weird symptoms together. That's CRPS. Vitamin C can be given prophylactically for this one. Pain with ulnar deviation when the thumb is flexed in the palm. Oh, the thumb is flexed in the palm and it's in a postpartum diabetic patient. What is this? What is this sign and what is this syndrome? And what are the muscles involved? So that's going to be a classic one. That's Finkelstein's test with the fingers inside like this, thumb inside, and then you ulnarly deviate like this. Ulnarly deviate, it pulls on the tendons here. And that's the Finkelstein's test. And that's de Curvain's tenosynovitis. And it's most common in patients that are postpartum and also diabetes. So they say most common in postpartum because they're holding up the baby a lot. So I guess if you're holding it up, you're chronically ulnarly deviating. And also diabetes, just because they have neuropathies. And what are those tendons? We said the adductor pollicis longus and the extensor pollicis brevis are involved. So adductor pollicis longus, extensor pollicis brevis. So next one is, a boy was trying to catch a baseball without a glove and subsequently hurt his finger. You note that it is pointed ventrally and he can't extend at the DIP. What's the diagnosis? So this is a good one. What is the treatment consideration that must be done for this patient? So this is gonna be a mallet finger, mallet finger. So mallet finger is an avulsion of the extensor tendon. So just the extensor tendon of the DIP is down because you've broken this part of it. It must be splint in uninterrupted extension to allow for the tendon to heal. If not, it'll end up with a swan neck over time. So over time, if you're chronically like this, then these ones are gonna get tighter up here and you're gonna have the swan neck like this. Next one, gamekeeper's or skier's thumb is due to damage of what? So what is injured when you have a gamekeeper's or a skier's thumb? That's gonna be the ulnar collateral ligament, the ulnar ligament of the thumb that is, possible avulsion of the proximal phalanx and a thumb spike, a splint is needed. So they're landing with their thumb outstretched like this. We have collateral lig ligaments on our thumb as well. So this is gonna be considered the ulnar one because in the um, anatomical positioning, that's what is ulnar. And you need to do a thumb spike, a splint for that. So a patient punched a wall and there's a 45 degree angulation noted on x-ray. What is the treatment and the name of this fracture? So of course, they punched a wall, it's the boxer's fracture. If the angulation is over 40 degrees, then you need to do open reduction internal fixation surgery. So if it's too much angulated, you need to do surgery for this condition. What's the difference between a Bennett and a Rolando fracture? So what's the difference between a Bennett and a Rolando fracture? Difference between Bennett and Rolando fracture is Rolando is a Y, so it's comminuted. So it's in the thumb and it's an intra, and Bennett is an intraarticular through the first base of the metacarpal. And the Rolando is the same thing, except it's comminuted and it looks like a Y on radiograph. Okay, next one is you shake a patient's hand and you ask them to further pronate their hand which causes them pain and paresthesia down the thumb in the first 2.5 digits. They deny any diabetes. What is this? That's pronator teres syndrome. So it's a medial, median nerve problem as well. However, it's entrapment um, of the pronator teres proximal to the elbow. So around the elbow there, entraps the pronator teres muscle or the median nerve within the pronator teres muscle rather. And it causes them those paresthesias in a similar distribution as carpal tunnel, however, they're pronating, which is what the pronated teres does, so it further entraps it in that scenario and elicits pain during that maneuver. Next one is what are the risk factors for carpal tunnel? So what are the risk factors for carpal tunnel? Important to know. When is the pain worse for patients with carpal tunnel? When is the, patient, when is the pain worse? Important one. What are the two must-know physical exam maneuvers for carpal tunnel? 
And if it's refract and, and if it is refractory to a volar splint, now do you do what? So you tried a few things. So risk factors, diabetes, hypothyroidism, rheumatoid arthritis, pregnancy. Remember, carpal tunnel is worse at night. You should know definitely the Phelan's and Tenille sign. So Tenille sign, again, a tapping sign. We saw that. This is tapping over the median nerve. We saw that in a bunch of other conditions, cubital tunnel, tarsal tunnel. Phelan sign is going like this for one minute, which should uh, recreate this paresthesias over the median nerve distribution. And if it's refractory to that volar splint, which they should be wearing at night, especially as it's worse then, you can do carpal tunnel surgery. So you can release that carpal tunnel and uh, create more space for those tendons. And that's a surgical release. Okay, so that completes all of the high yield topics for the orthopedic section um, and rheumatology section of the pants study guide.